George's method is basically taking Dr. Suzuki's method and Francois Rabat's method and, and molding them together in a brilliant way. Welcome to another episode of Contrabass Conversations, your show covering life on the low end of the spectrum. I'm your host, Jason Heath, and I'm so glad to have you here today. Visit our site at ContrabassConversations.com for all the details about what's going on here. And I'd love to hear from you. Send me an email, feedback at ContrabassConversations.com. Let me know a little bit about who you are, what you're interested in, any recommendations for the show. That would be awesome. And this week, we're doing something special. We're getting into the whys and the hows of teaching. We're talking teaching in private lessons. We're talking teaching in public schools. We're talking teaching at the university level. And we're talking teaching with a long-term focus about teaching the complete musician way beyond just the notes on the page. And you can learn more about teaching at ContrabassConversations.com slash teaching. This is a new resource that I'm launching this week and I'm super excited about it. So give it a visit, share it with students, share it with colleagues, anybody that you think it could benefit. It's a compilation of what I've learned here about resources for teaching, repertoire sequences, recordings to start with, gear, everything that the beginning student, intermediate student, advanced student needs to know. It's a synthesis of all these hundreds of interviews, and I've been thinking about doing this for so long, and I finally did it. So check it out. Let me know what you think. So today, we are talking about teaching with Johnny Hamill, and Johnny has dedicated his life to teaching bass. He started out as a music education student, and he met George Vance at an International Society of Bassists convention, and his life was never the same after that. And we talk about the whys and the hows of starting a bass festival. He started the Kansas City Bass Workshop, the KC Bass Workshop, which has grown into an amazing event, one of the top bass events in the country. He also recommends that every town have a bass festival. And it's the perfect abundance mindset. I'm sure you're familiar with that term. Johnny just has that in spades. It's so cool. And, you know... Austin, Minneapolis, New Jersey, new bass festivals are springing up all over the place. It's like The Walking Dead, but for bass festivals. I mean, in the best way possible. I've started two bass festivals myself. I started the Whitewater Winter Bass Festival at the University of Wisconsin Whitewater, and I helped get the Chicago Bass Festival going, and both are still going strong. So I am totally in Johnny's camp in terms of that. Every town needs to have a bass festival. We have the Golden Gate Bass Camp here in San Francisco. Richard Duke does a fantastic job with that. And it's such an amazing thing for the community. We also talk about Johnny's book, Jamming on the Bass, which is an improvisational accompaniment to the Vance Progressive Repertoire series. How cool is that? That We've got a link in the show notes, so check that out. And he's got some pages up available for you to check out. We also hear some snippets from Johnny's new band, Gab70. And before we get going, I'd like to let you know about our sponsor, Diderio Strings. And they're Zyx Strings, which I've got on my bass right now. I love them. They've got a great growl. They've got a nice gut-like sound. They sound great under the bow. They've got great pizzicato sustain. Lots of artists use them. Barry Bales, Missy Raines, Mark Helios, Chris Jennings, Yuri Slavic. You can get them in medium and light. I'm using the medium right now and love them. You can get a C extension string for them too, the long E. They're made in the United States, made in New York at the D'Addario String Factory. Check them out and thank you, D'Addario, for sponsoring the podcast. Now, Getting into Johnny's talk, Johnny starts out talking about the podcast, which is very humbling. So thank you, Johnny. And we dig into his experiences working with George Vance in the bass studio and the bass camp and that whole evolution. And we also were talking about doing Skype lessons to people in rural areas before I flipped on the microphone. So that's what I'm talking about the first minute or so of the interview. All right, here we go with our interview with Johnny Hamill. I wanted to say, and I haven't done this, I don't think online just because I always get so busy, but I love all your posts and your interviews and what you're doing is just a really great thing. So I want to thank you personally because it takes somebody interested in it like yourself and doing it. It's a, 
it's a noble cause. Cool, cool, man. I, I, I appreciate it. And thanks a lot for saying that. And I mean, you're talk about a noble cause. I mean, just in terms of like, what I, what I've seen you doing, it's definitely, it looks like a labor of love. And, and it's funny you mentioned the Skype lessons to the people in areas where there's just nobody. That's one of the things that's so cool to me about doing the, the podcast. You know, I'll get these yeah. e- emails from people like, I live in rural Australia, you know, and I'm yeah. three hours from the nearest town, but I've been listening to all these people and, and learning. And that's what, that just is so, so cool to me about this era we're in, you know, that you can reach people like that. That's exactly right. And I mean, you said that labor loves that, you know, that's what drives me. And of course, you know, like I'm one of those people that I love all things base. So when something comes up on the internet, that's just base. I just find myself reading it anyway, you know, because obviously we don't read the newspaper anymore. We just have our little phones and, and we're on the subway or waiting for something. And we're, so we, we tend to get caught up in that stuff. And of course, if it's the great articles like you it's much more than you know a fluffy kitten or whatever <laughs> distract us so it is good and the, and the times have changed and we need to know that and what you said reaching those people that's it's really great so i guess uh, i wanted to also say my main motivation is to get more people to play the bass at younger ages and that's everything that i try to do is calculated towards that from the workshop tours from my own workshop, from my own bass studio, from my own even professional playing, performing life, I try to integrate it all into finding some parent that says, hey, this is really amazing, and I'd rather my kids start on the bass than cello or the violin or the electric guitar, you know, whatever, just pick that instrument because bass players are the coolest people on the planet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I know I'm biased, but, you know, I also have a lot of evidence that proves my point. I, I don't think I've met any bass player that I just didn't really love. We're all pretty humble and beautiful people from the inside out. So it's a beautiful family to introduce kids to and have them grow up in the family. That's great. It's exciting. I mean, it's cool that you start kids that young. Do you, What's the youngest that you have started somebody? I totally changed my life. When I met George Vance at ISB, and I believe it was 96, 97, it was the one in Houston. But, you know, it was by chance that I went to ISB because it was a bass thing. And, and, you know, I didn't really know the bass could do all the wonderful things that it did. And uh, I went there because I was, I was almost done with my undergrad in music education, getting ready to go teach in the orchestra and, and hopefully have a jazz band on side, you know, that kind of dream. And I uh, went there and totally got blown away, you know, like the bass is an amazing instrument. And of course, it couldn't be more on display at that ISB because it was, you know, I saw the, the Ray Brown trio with Christian Bride, John Clayton, and uh, I saw uh, Bert Tresky for the first time, Mark Dresser for the first time, Francois Raboff for the first time. I mean, it, the list goes on and on and on as far as all the heroes in our lives. I met George there. I didn't know he was the George Vance because hey, I'd never heard that name before. And I was going to all these, you know, lectures on teaching because that was where my mind was, was learn how to be a better teacher. And uh, he happened to be sitting next to me at like one of the first lectures I went to and actually handed me a pencil or something. <laughs> and then, you know, so I was just got, you know, George was a very nice person and I told him who I was and what I was doing and, and he said, oh, and I, he said, I teach. And he said, so I said, what kind of, what what do you recommend for to, for me to go check out? You know, he's been there before. And so he's, he said, well, the next guy is, is this Francois Raboff guy is really good. He's, he's doing a master class next. And when I walked out of that one, I was like, I'm just going to follow you all week because you know what you're talking about. <laughs> And so in the next year, I went out to his workshop, which was, I mean, ISB and George's workshops are probably the most significant thing in my life, for sure. Uh, I always say I learned more there in a week than I did in my undergrad. Just That's not true, but, you know, that's the way you feel when you leave those weeks. Man, I wish I could have met George Vance. You know, I never got the chance to. How how cool. And like, he like totally changed the course of what you were thinking of doing, right? I mean, you were getting a music ed degree. Exactly. And so, you know, I just 
came home after that thing. And I mean, I had to finish my, I did my student teaching and, and I uh, actually was like, no, I'm not getting a job. I'm going to go do this other thing. Teach little kids how to play the bass. And I got kind of a big backlash because of course they wanted me to take a real job. <laughs> and, <yeah. laughs> so, you know, fortunately for me, I'm stubborn and independent and I set up my bass studio and kept, doing what I'm still doing, which is trying to convince parents to start their kid on base. So I've been doing that since that's been my professional life since whatever, 98, 99, I guess is when I yeah. went full time. I still gig and freelance and write my own music and everything. But I could say I've never really had to, my parents would say I never got a real job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is fine with me, but you know, obviously I probably work harder than most people have a nine to five. I'd love to know, like, what what are some things that you do to, obviously, we know the bass is cool, and people listening to this, like, bass rocks, but not not every, especially parent of a three-year-old, five-year-old, seven-year-old, whatever, might know that, right? I mean, like, how many kids get sent to violin or piano or cello, you know, if they want to carry something around big? How do you show them the magic of the bass, well, I mean, I do a lot of talking, that's yeah. for sure. And obviously, just me talking here kind of gives you that insight. <laughs> but I do tell them, as far as like when I convince a parent to start, you know, I mean, George's method is basically taking Dr. Suzuki's method and Francois Rabat's method and, and molding them together in a brilliant way, which if you don't know that, that's kind of uh, very important. So I taught, I sit them down and I, I, I have worked and, you know, I uh, have a lot of colleagues that are Suzuki certified. I've been to as many of those things as I can possibly do. So I do use a lot of the principles of, of Suzuki, which is you are really training the parents how to raise a musical child. And so the parents are practicing with them every day. But to convince them, you know, one of the things that I usually always say is not only do they, do they not know the expressiveness of how great the bass can be, the typical parent just thinks of the bass as the, you know, accompaniment, and they don't even know what the bass is. I mean, I grew up that way. I didn't know what the bass was until they put a bass in my hand. And then I went, oh, it's low. <laughs> you know, like, oh, I get it now. It all makes sense. And I've never felt demoted to the bass. I felt promoted to the bass because it's an awesome sound. But I think most people don't know that. They don't hear it in their daily lives. They feel it, but they actually don't know what that sound is creating because it's underneath all the other instruments all the time. And so what I usually tell them is name any music that you can think of and there's a bass line to it. And so you're not, if you teach them the violin, they're still going to be limited to only music that's created on violin, which is not true for the bass. You know, like we, one of the most joyous things about my life is that I go play tango this weekend and then I'll play free jazz on the next day and then I go play a Black Sabbath gig on the next day. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> it's, it's the greatest thing ever, in my opinion. I get to enjoy music from all cultures, all styles, and the bass players are really doing that service of bringing, making the music happen. You know what I mean? Like bringing culture to wherever they live, to wherever they're at. And uh, that's the most exciting thing about the instrument. I, I usually always point that out. It's they can grow as far as uh, sometimes I tell the parent about playing a bowed instrument like that as far as wiring the brain at a young age, you know. I think there's something about moving the bow in one direction with one set of pressure and then your left hand's going in a different direction. <laughs> like it just wires the brain in an amazing way. But, you know, obviously you get all the aspects of playing music and teaching your child things that are more than just will help them in their lives. So I, I hit them with all that if I can, you know, and just try to inspire them to do it because, you know, as far as the parents go, it's an enjoyable thing, but I'm asking a lot of them, like any Suzuki parent would know, 
it's not just a walk down joyous lane, you know, <laughs> they're going to have to dedicate time to their child every evening and play with them. I mean, which is probably the most important part, you know, like in today's society, it's easy to drop them off at karate and then go shopping and come back and pick them up. That's not what's happening in a, in a musical parent. You know, they have to sit there and practice with them at, at a certain age. When they get 10, 12, then that's okay. But there's a lot of time there. If you talk to my parents, they would all say how, how wonderful of an experience that was for them. You know, like it, they really bonded with their child over teaching them music, which is really great. You, you reminded me of a line. I don't know if you know Danny Zeman, but uh, he, he was saying, I think it's actually a Jeff Campbell line, but bass is the only instrument with its own knob on the stereo. You know, and I, I, mm. I, I, I love that line because it's true. That's a great one. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, I'm going to use that. Yeah. Gonna, I, I haven't heard it, but yeah. uh, thank you, Danny. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> We need t-shirts. Maybe the next ISP can just be says that on a shirt. Yeah. You know, like they always have a logo, you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's great. Ask Danny if we can, if we can use that. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm sure he'd be thrilled to pass that one along. So tell me about the, the Casey workshop, like when that idea came about and just how it's evolved. Well, the, the Casey workshop is, we just completed our seventh year. And the history of it is that George was always asking me to do a workshop because I every year would take, you know, I would have, I, I have a studio of around 40 students. And so there's 40 bass players that come to me every week and we have concerts and we do all, they all grow and get better and have fun and, and do what we just described. But every year I would drive across the country and go to George's workshop. And every year, every other year, I would drive to George's workshop and I would go to ISV, you know, and I would drag as many students as I could to the workshops. And those that would go to the workshops would just like their trajectory was just like exponential to the kids that weren't going. You know what I mean? Like they were, some of the kids that weren't going were working just as hard at home and in their practice room, but they weren't getting the results that the kids that went to these things were just inspired for life. Already, they got it, you know, like they didn't have, you didn't have to try to convince them to do, you know, to play this piece or that piece or, you know, they, they, they already had like 20,000 things that they wanted to do, <laughs> which was fantastic. So I would bemoan this fact to him that I could only get three or four people to come all this way because it was just, it's really too much to ask of the parents because it becomes their whole family vacation. If they have a single child, they can bring them every year. But even then it starts getting like, okay, we've been doing this for a couple of years. We need to go to Hawaii or something instead, you know, like they don't want to do it every year. So he talked about starting a workshop in my own town because for those kids that aren't going and uh, I knew he was right. I decided not to do it because a, I was like, well, how do I start a workshop? You know, like that, the task seemed daunting for myself. Looking back, one of the biggest mistakes was that I was like, Oh, I need to have 20 grand in the bank just in case it flops. So, you know, like it's going to take a couple of years of getting started and, and some of that is true, you know, like you have to come up with the, the money to do it. So I, I didn't do it. So it, so it would probably be in, would be on its 10th, 5th, 12th year or something like that when I first started talking to him about it. And uh, then George came down with pancreatic cancer. And, and then so my last conversation with him was he was not well, you know, it was he knew it was our last conversation and uh, George was always good at saying things to me that just resonated with me. I mean, he is definitely my main mentor in life. You know, some of the things he's ever told me were just, sometimes they were always head scratches. Like, what does that mean, George? But they always are just, he was such a great philosopher in a lot of ways. But he just said, well, it looks like I won't be coming to the base workshop you keep talking about. <laughs> That's the, his line. And, you know, it just, cut me to a core, you know, I was just bawling my head off and, you know, I mean, you can 
just imagine. So I, I hung up the phone and started calling people. And that summer we had the first workshop. That's why the workshop's always dedicated to George Fant. And most of what goes on is, is his pedagogy. And he's just fantastic at it because I love George mainly because he was thinking about how great the next generation will become. And he just opened that door to that. I mean, he kind of knew what was, what was coming and, and all that. And his books really have a, a strong vision of where the child would go. You know, he knew that the Dragonetti would be a, a middle school piece and and it is, you know, it's kind of hard, <laughs> hard for me to even, you know, swallow that down because I'm like, what? But That's true. The Dragon Eddy, when you go through that, it has become a middle school piece. Isn't that amazing? Easy. I mean, you know, like usually, you know, when you start them at five or six, you know, they're going to know the Dragon Eddy before they even get out of elementary school. And I mean, I definitely have that and seen it and have had not just a few that's gotten there, but but many of my students know that piece. And, uh, and that's now that I go around the world to all these, or around the country, at least to all these base workshops, that's just true. You know, like it's, it's shown the way for the students to do it. You know, it's not just like some random kid goes, Oh, I'm going to learn this big concerto, you know, like there's a blueprint plan right there. He just goes right in, in order of his book. And, you know, it's, it's fantastic. So, And it kind of brings the bass into parody with the other, like, violin. And, you know, I, how, many, how many young violinists, middle school violinists, do I hear playing the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto, right? I mean, if you... Yeah, look- exactly. So now, yeah, now we don't, we're not... And, and, and that's the beauty of the whole system. And, 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 you know, the same with Suzuki Violin Method. It's just, it's kind of brilliant because it, it lets the students become an artist instead of just here, you know, like how I learned how to play classical music was a lot of, here's the etude books. Now go hit it. You know, when you would just, <laughs> yeah. you would just practice dedicated practice, you know, like tough it out. And, you know, it's kind of the tough it survives, but you know, with George's book, each piece is slowly giving you a different technique, slowly growing your posture, slowly growing the bow arm and the left hand is this why it jumps around so much, which was definitely a big head scratcher when I first saw that. I was like, why are you showing these kids how to play way up high? You know, like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, we're bass players. What are you doing? But it's, it's brilliant. You know, like, it's, if you think about posture, it's perfect. If you're going to play the whole instrument, you know, you're going to have to stand the way that you're supposed to stand to play the whole instrument, not on the side with the way that the picture of the Samando book, <laughs> like, that, 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 that does limit you to the bottom half of the instrument, you know, which is why the Samando book doesn't go up there. You know, like it, it's just a, a wonderful, beautiful thing, technically, uh, musically, you know, the, I remember just reading through it. And as I said, I was an undergrad, I was just reading through the books and, you know, most of it was fairly simple and easy. And, and I was like, this is a wonderful etude, you know, like long, long ago. Wow. That's much better than the etude. I had to practice relentlessly to learn to shift, you know, (laughs) (laughs) you like, it's just, it's kind of a nice little piece. And the students at a young age don't know that they just are joyously playing in this piece because they think it's cool. Well, and it's, it's so many parallels to the Suzuki. Like it's the same thing. How do violinists learn to do those shifts through these, these pieces that they're doing? Yeah. Every piece is an, is an etude. And so that's why George was adamant about it being a, a studio method. A lot of people use them cherry pick through the, through the pieces, but he was like, this is, this is like Suzuki didn't cherry pick through the pieces. He had them learn one piece after another. You could teach each piece a different piece every week, you know, if you like. And then as long as they're always reviewing the pieces and playing them, they, they grow 
and uh, it's really nice. So I'd love to know. And I mean, man, that's that not cherry picking going through. Like I, I'm remembering back to one of my violinist students in my old orchestra job invited me to the the Betty Haig Suzuki School concert at Symphony Center in Ch- Chicago. Right. So you have everybody from the three year olds, the five year olds. You know, the parents are helping them go the right direction on on stage to the to the sixteen year olds who are playing Zugunerweisen in unison. Right. And right. And right. There's power in that. And I was like watching these students get up and play for an hour from memory, these pieces. It's a powerful thing, man. Yeah, it is powerful. And it's great. I mean, I just witnessed what 28 bass players playing the Bach prelude, which was I almost cried, you know, (laughs) because I was like, that's the piece that, you know, I was like, you know, the Dragon Eddie was one thing. But to me, I held special love in my heart for the Bach cello suite. And it was George actually was like, here, you should try it. And I told him, I was like, no, that piece is too hard for me. Uh-huh. You know, like, right. and I was, you know, I was kind of, I didn't ever have reservations on pieces. So this is just, the story holds that key to saying where we are now. We're, we're at a different place as bass players because now everybody's like, oh yeah, the, the Bach tells me they sound good on the bass, you know? Yeah. Like it's just something to do. And, and I would probably argue that, you know, the Bach cello suites are going to be a middle school piece one day, too, which is going to be something hard for me to fathom also. But that's the kind of vision that George gave me anyway as a teacher. And a good teacher gets out of the student's way because most of my students are far better musicians than I am. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm good, but, you know, they're going to be great you know it's not that they don't need help but most of them just are you know my personal daughter played through the box hell suite and she did it by ear because she was raised through the system and and i just walked in on she was practicing i walked in and i stood at the door so she didn't know i was listening and she played through the whole the whole first suite and she just looked when i walked in i was even more shocked because there wasn't the music wasn't on the stand. And she just looked at me, she was like, what is that? And I was just like, ah. I was a little jealous. And also, in all, you know, like, I was like, that's pretty amazing. So music, when it exists like that, we, as, as teachers, we could, we could give them the baggage to say that's hard. And so that's what I wanted to say that about the prelude. For me, it was just mentally hard. There was not anything technically hard about playing that if I didn't have that baggage of it. You know what I mean? I absolutely, absolutely know what you mean. And it's such an interesting, man, you've been right at this crux of like this sea change. I think George Vance, just that method has had so much to do with, right? Like the nineties, like starting to get that, that is, that is so, I've got a, I've got a question for you, a guy dying to, but a lot of people that, that listen would be interested in this. Like I look at my base studio, you know, I've got a studio going here in San Francisco now and I just, I get a lot of kids that are like 15, right? Let's say. And they've been playing. Me too. Me too. So how do you, inco- and, and this is the thing that I always struggle with. How do you incorporate them into this, this system that you have? Or how do you, how do you, uh, I, I mean, I was just thinking about this yesterday. It's like, I want to work. He, this, this student needs these pieces. Yeah, they're, they're 15 and you're asking them to play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And man, and man is that hard. And I see the look in their eyes. It is. Yeah. No, it's so hard. Uh, well, first, you should know that, you know, at, at one point, because I've always had what I, because that, that's what I am. I am a crossover student. You know, I didn't, I didn't start playing classical music until I was older. I was 17, you know, like then I discovered the bow, which was amazing. I didn't even know that could happen. I was a rock and roll musician, highly dedicated. I could, like a lot of rock musicians, we learn everything by ear, which is very valuable thing when you can sit down and play along with all your favorite records. You know, you just learn it the way Ray Brown tells you to learn jazz, you know, (laughs) know, get your CDs and play along with it until you know what they are. That's a valuable tool. So um, that crossover student can be very, very powerful. What I usually tell them and, and, and even, you know, the Suzuki thing, like 
Suzuki would always make them play Twinkle Twinkle Little Star every day in their lesson because he was really just working on figuring out to perfect the bow arm because he knew that the rest of the stuff would be fine. Occasionally some things about the left hand. But so what I usually do is I do the same thing. George was pretty adamant about saying that the instead of Twinkle, it's, it's Scott was burning because it's two open strings at the beginning of the song. So you get uh, string crossings and resonance. And then, then once you start pushing the left hand down, it sometimes stops the resonance from the bow. So I always have them play Scotland's Burning to warm up. And I usually look at them and I say, hey, a baseball player is going to go over on the on deck circle and, and swing that bat. You know, why is he swinging the bat? You don't think he knows how to swing the bat by now? You know, like you got to warm up the most important thing to make the performance better. And so we're working on that. And uh, it usually sets their posture and it sets their bow arm. They're not thinking about the notes anymore because it's the easiest song on the planet to memorize. Right. And eventually I say, oh, well, the whole first book is like that. You know, like, don't look at the sheet music. Just George trained me to say the sheet music in the lesson is illegal. You know, like you're, you're not teaching them the technique. If you're just having them stare at the book, they're not staring at the, at the technique. So, you know, we use iPods, it's the the phones and we always videotape ourselves and watch it. And then I have big mirrors and, and then we play it together and I make them track my bow arm and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to get over the technical. But so for the adult, I say, yeah, this is just a baby piece. I can't wait to show you a really cool piece. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's nice about George's book, by the time you get to something like country dance, it doesn't sound like a, a little kid's piece, you know, like it, it sounds, it sounds pretty good. Like I could play that for an adult. And they're going to go, Hey, that sounds great. You know, I didn't know the bass could do that. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be like, Oh, that's twinkle, twinkle little star. So that's the first thing as far as the older kids go is that if you understand that some of the pieces will be kind of difficult for them to rifle through on a, a motivational level, secondary, like, so that's growing the bow. And if you understand how the books work, you can, you know, just say, well, just play through it, you know, like play through it and we're going to find the piece that you really love. That's the one that they play a lot. And then the other ones, you just tell them, you know, because anybody that's 15 is going to understand they have to go do something, exercises or something to get better. Right. 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 And so usually I say, well, the first part of that book is, just think of them as your scales for right now. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. That That's the technical thing that I need you to invest in. And that's what the teacher always brings it back to, the technical aspects that you want to think of the one thing that they need to work on to get better by the next time you see them. Yeah. And so if it's, if it's that, you're just saying all these songs, they're just technique builders. Okay. And they're your scales. This is what I need you to do. Just play these songs and I might, if they're, not that dedicated student, I might actually write out which songs they need to play that day. Right, right. And if they need the shoe music at home, that's fine to help remind themselves what finger to push down or something, you know. Or if they play by ear, that's cool too. The second thing is, is George watched me work with my first group of students. And what happened was we would always play some of his songs. And then they would always be waiting for this thing to happen, which was... Um, my first young student was my nephew and my second one was my daughter. Just, we were having so much fun. She wouldn't, she would not come play the bass. Okay. You know, she was yeah. like, I'm playing the bass with you because <laughs> you guys are having too much fun. So then I just would always jam with them because they were, you know, I mean, they were my family too. So after we get done with the lesson, I would always just start doing what bass players do. And, you know, one of the things that always happens to me is that I always start making up a groove and I start jamming on it, you know, like that's, that's, that's what bass players do. Right. 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 Exactly. <laughs> so I've always done that. And, uh, you know, he just saw me doing that. And the first thing that I ever did was just jam on shortening bread because the first thing in my mind was, Hey, that's not how shortening bread goes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's not the way we sing it. It's swung and let's just jam on it. So, you know, they already knew where their hands went. So I just, started singing it and playing it and we'd have a little jam session. Oh, nice. And so George looked at me and, uh, he saw that and he was 
we were hanging around afterwards. And by that time I was teaching at the camp too. And he just said, John, you should write the improv book that goes along with my book. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, and I looked at him and I was like, Rufus Reed is right there. Why don't you let him do it? And he's like, well, you, you, you might, you might be work with the kids enough, you know, like, I think it would be good for you to do it. And I was like, oh, okay. You know, like I just kind of shrugged. This is again, one of those things. But so basically I wrote this book over the last 10, 15 years of playing with the kids that systematically goes from point A to point B. And so I have volume one published now because I was being lazy again because the workshops take so much time that basically they want to do the editing part, sure. you know, like sure. oh, put yeah. it all. And, and since most of it, I was just doing it with my kids, my own studio, and I didn't spend the time to edit it, publish it. But uh, it was Nick Walker that I think he threatened, threatened me physically. You could say that <laughs> in, in the interview <laughs> that more people need to see this uh, and use it. And so I, I published it two years ago. And so I just mainly have volume one published and the sequence towards the end is, is not as good as I like it to be. Cause as I told him, I was like, Hey, George took years to publish. If you look at all the earlier versions, you're like, Oh, he has all these cool pieces in there. And some of them are not there anymore because they just didn't fit the sequence. Okay. I didn't. So it's really amazing to, to see some of that. So I should have most, all the volumes done volume one through three, where it starts with shortening bread and then it, ends up, um, you know, with improvising hard bop tunes, too. Nice. I, I would like it to improvise, you know, Baroque sonatas, too, because that's something that I usually say is why do classical musicians don't improvise is that kind of mindset is, is going away also. The reading is super important in classical music because you don't have time to not read. You've got too much information to go through. And I think that's one of the major reasons why improvisation went away in most classical, because they were too afraid that the student wouldn't learn to read, you know, proficiently. But especially with the bass, as you know, if you're not playing a classical gig, most of the time you go professionally from even the tango gigs, you know, they don't have real notes. They just have chord progressions, and you're supposed to play this, and improvise a bass line to this chord progression in this dial. That's what you have to do. That's very required on, on, on the upright bass, not just jazz gigs, but you know, most gigs that I know of that are other bass, they don't have the notes written out. And of course, some of my colleagues are just classically trained. They're just like, I don't know how to do that. And that was always a head scratcher to me because I was like, how do you not know how to do that? <laughs> it's easy because, <laughs> as you know, mo most of the time it's only a couple of chords. You know, like even in tango, it's still, you know, the diatonic chord sequence most of the time. And so I, I wanted to make sure that I taught that to my students. So as far as the 15-year-old goes, a lot of them are electric bass players who are starting to play, right? Sure, right. Uh, the upright bass player. So that goes right along with them. In fact, I'm one of the reasons why I haven't done volume two and three was I needed to rethink it so that it's not only is it a book that an upright bass player can, if they knew the kids that know those songs. And then when they hit that age, they're, they're like, I want to play the electric bass because my friends are playing in a rock band and they want an electric bass, not an upright bass. Then they can go to this thing and they, they know how to play both instruments just easy. And so it, it also has, like a pullout that goes all the tabs to it so they see fingerings and different fingerings for the electric bass oh, cool. versus the upright bass, which is probably the the biggest thing other than the right hand plucking. Right. So if they already know how to do that on the upright, then it transfers into the electric bass pretty easy. I love that. That is, that is, I can't wait to check out though. I, I got to check out volume one myself. I can't wait. That's, that is very, very cool. And, and yeah, that's the thing is like, you got to learn how to exist outside of the written notation because I mean, that's the beauty of the bass. Like we were talking about earlier. Is, yeah. Exactly. And so a lot of times I, I want, I wanted that book to, to do that because, you know, like not only does, a modern classical composer need to understand, you know, what modern classical composer doesn't just lives in the world of Bach and Mozart, you know, like 
they don't. I mean, I, I play contemporary classical music and they're always influenced by jazz, rock, funk, hip hop, every, you know, everything that's new on our tongue. Cause that's the musical DNA, you know, of w- why you would want to go listen to something. Not that Mozart and Bach aren't genius. And I love all that, but as we said, music as an art, you know, I, I don't just go and to the museum and see one art. I want to go and see lots of different cultures to art. And yeah. So, I, that's a great, that's a great uh, way to look at it. Going to the museum. I don't want to just look, I love that. I got to I'm going to use that line. <laughs> yeah, it's good. I'm sure I stole it from somebody else. We need variety and, a, and, and we need to teach variety. I mean, I'm the first culprit of, of teaching too much Bach just because I love him so much. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> but you know, like at some point I know there's that. And, uh, of course, that's where I love Francois Rabat, because when you listen to his music, it's just this great, amazing hybrid of, you know, the great jazz heritage that he has. You know, I mean, for me at the time when I met Francois Rabat, I was way deep into, you know, the free jazz movement of Ornette and Sun Ra and all that stuff. I just loved that stuff so much more than the classics. I, I mean, I... I would listen to the classic, but I don't, I don't think I was just in love with it as much as I was with all the bitches brew era. Miles Davis was just like, Oh God, you know, like it was, <laughs> it was so cool. Just so great. Cause there were so many sounds there that I liked. It just struck me more. And so I love that. And the first time I heard Francois, I was, it was like free jazz to me. So if you listen to the early baseball stuff with the drums and everything, it's just so, it's right up there with a the great free jazz record. <laughs> yeah, no, it's true. It totally has those elements. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And then his his Middle Eastern heritage, his in his phrasing. I mean, you just gotta hear that. And of course, his classical playing is just great. And I lumped him into he was a classical bass player at first, and then as I got more into his his sound and his technique, it was more wide open like that. Yeah. I, I love that about him the most. His sense of melodic phrasing, when you think of him and all the great, you know, singers he's played with, it's just, oh, it makes sense why he can make your heart melt. <laughs> that, that's that's just in his, you know, musical DNA. So I would say that to kind of put that all in a bow is that idea that George was asking me to do this workshop for a reason because he knew it would bring not only my students to the table of seeing the larger artistry of, of the bass. Cause that's very hard to do, especially when you're, I mean, some people are in a town where they get to see groundbreaking artists all the time, but it's really hard to see groundbreaking bass players all the time. Like I live in Kansas city. It's, it's a good stop for artists. And I believe Edgar Meyer and Victor Wooten don't live too far from here, but they still only come, you know, once every two or three years, you know, you can't just go see them multiple times a year or anything like that. And that would probably be true with most bass soloists. So the, the workshop's been uh, integral in spreading that information to other people. So not only are you getting the kids coming to your city to hear these bass, work with the bass players on, a, on an educational level, but you're also having the artists come here and perform Like, it's a big deal that they come and they come and play. The last three years, I actually separated the the workshop from what I call the KC Bass Fest, which means that there's this just concert series at night that's really, I mean, we all know that from the ISB, you know, like there's so many people playing and so much teaching going on and everything. And that it's it's hard to catch everything, and we we have to like sit down with the schedule and mark down which ones we know we have to go see. <laughs> so what's been happening the last three years is just the public at large wants to come hear these concerts. Part of that's with Francois Rabat because he's such an amazing performer. You know, like his, how many times I've seen this summer five five concerts this summer. I even stayed for the last one. I was I didn't know if I was going to stay for till his concert, but then I just was like, no, I can't miss that concert it was the same concert you know like it i mean he threw in some pieces here and there but it's essentially the same same uh repertoire you know it wasn't like he was just changing it every time but um it was still just as 
amazing the first time as the last. I mean, he still gets me every time. Like I'm my out of body experience. My, my body's vibrating like that, you know, like that the, that the bass instrument can do that. You know, like it, it doesn't just happen with Francois. He's just one of the greatest at doing that. You know, like my old Davis did that to me with his trumpet, you know, like he, he brought me out of my body. Great performers in rock have done that to me too. And other great performers, you know, just what music does to the soul is just standing there live and all of a sudden you're, you're floating above the audience, just shaking because the music's so great. That can happen on the bass. So more people are coming to these concerts. This year we had Mark Dresser. He did the same thing. And, you know, I don't think he, he played one, one tonal tonal piece the whole time. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which was great. You know, like it was just like, ah. Uh, and, you know, great jazz performers, pretty amazing concert series that we, we have that just kind of dropped in our lap because they're here to teach. Yeah. What a great idea, though. I love that. I love to say, you know, uh, at the Richard Duke at the Golden Gate Base Camp this summer did the sim- similar thing, uh, had an evening concert that they marketed to the public as comes because you got these great artists here. That's that's so I, I love the idea of separating it out like that. And these artists are there in Kansas City. They want to perform. Right. So it's a total win win. You're exposing the audience to the base. You're giving them those kind of magical moments like you're describing with hearing Francois or Mark. I, yeah. Man, that's so, that's such a great idea. Well, and it's, and it's good because it's good for everyone. Because like I said, I, I said at the beginning of the interview, my main job is to convince parents to start them on base. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that those parents afterwards were just like, yes, we're, you know, not only are we doing the right thing, but we love this. Now. It's a hard thing to tell people that the base can be that great verbally Mm -hmm. you know what i mean oh yeah but when you sit them in the audience and see that kind of thing the final concert is like you know like i have the artist perform with everyone on the final concert for that exact reason the camp is mainly focused on solo bass play you know like i i would love to spend time on on everything else regarding the bass but if we don't do this push the solo thing then the technique isn't as far you know the kids minds aren't changed adults minds also you know like it's it's like i said just about my own story i was an adult when i learned all this and i had to rethink that thing i mean i i had to tell myself i am going to play all six cello suites you know right. <laughs> like that's just a dream of mine you know like i'm on number four man <laughs> it's good and I love it. And so, you know, it's one of those things that changing everyone's mindsets from kids to adults. The workshop is so powerful in doing that and inspiring parents to start their kids on it, giving them the yearly feedback like that to remind them of why they're still doing that. Because, it's, you know, in, in America, it's so easy to get distracted. You know, when, one week they're into bass and the next week they're into soccer or rugby or whatever, you know, like there's so many other things that they just go down. So the yearly workshop is vital. And I would say that, you know, like even the the professional bass players in Kansas City, they love it because I've invited them all in. The first year it was perceived as Johnny Hamill's studio bass camp because those were the primary students, you know, that were there, you know, then it got perceived as a uh, Raboff camp, you know, yes, it's going to be heavily Raboff. He's there. George's technique is heavily Raboff, but there's just as much jazz going on. There's just as much electric bass players are coming. If you're just into playing the bass, there's an hour every day that the kids get up and perform. Every teacher, every faculty person comes and performs. It's not the ivory tower. It's, it's everybody just making the music for the sake of music for an hour, it becomes really powerful. This is, goes to the last thing I would say is I, some people think I'm absolutely crazy, but I do believe in talking to George that the reason why he was asking me to do it in my town, she was not afraid that if I started one in Kansas City, that it would all of a sudden his workshop would be, you know, nobody would show up to his workshop. It's not a competition because he understood what I was saying, which was, Parents 
from Kansas City can't afford to send their kids every year to all the way to Washington D.C. You know, like it, they're from time, money. It's just difficult. But if they have it in their own town, then it's easy for them to make it. The professionals, you know, if they're not working for the week, they're all stopping by. You know, if they have a gig on Tuesday, you know, they'll tell us and we tell everybody to go there after hours. It's just such a really great thing. Much like the ISB is great. It just pulls us all together for one week in that town. Anybody that I know that's a young based teacher in some other town, I'm like, I want to help you make a workshop. And since I've done it all myself, I know the steps to doing things like writing the little thing that says, please don't sue me because I'm trying to do the thing, <laughs> you know, like all that and funding and, and scheduling and, and here's what I do. And I just talk to them. And, uh, so the first one I did that one with, with Brian Russell in Twin Cities, I just, he came here and I said, man, you should, you should do one in your town. And he said, yes, I'm going to. And there was actually a couple of people in Minneapolis that were saying they were going to do it for many years and they just didn't do it. But Brian's my hero because he's crazy like me and just decided that this is what needs to be done. You dedicate a lot of your personal lifetime to doing this thing, but look what you have. Then you have all these people coming to your town. You learn so much. You know what I mean? Like you just, the the reciprocal relationship is amazing. So Twin Cities is amazing workshop. Austin started, uh, Jessica Vall started hers. New Jersey, this year we actually did a one-day camp for George's workshop in D.C. again, which was just amazing for me to be in George's house again with Martha Vance, George's widow, and Francois. We were all in his house again, and it was a personally powerful moment for me, but it was great. So, you know, there's many, like the San Francisco has the Golden Gate Base Camp. You know how lucky you are if you're there. You know what I mean? You can look at all your students and say, hey, we have this cool thing. Go to it. So if we get things like that started all over, every little town has one. Just imagine the Oh, What's going to happen? Why well, no? Well, I just I resonate so strong with me every everything that you're describing, and and it's great for the commu- It's great for the students. It's great for the professionals in the community. It's great for the the public. It's just this huge, it, and it and it's a local event. And like you're saying, you, you, it's so hard to traipse across the country to go to this one event. And it's a rising tide lifts all ships kind of thing. It's not you're nobody's going to cannibalize the KC workshop uh, out in what wherever in the west coast or in the south or in the east coast it's just, yeah 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 that's exactly right i mean that's i mean occasionally i'll have an influx of people traveling here to come and there is always going to be some people coming just because you know like the year at the end came i had three people going he hasn't been to the states since you know, George's camps and I just couldn't, I couldn't wait to go, you know, like, and I told that to Etienne and he's like, Oh really? That's good. You know, like he had no idea that he had that impact on those kids, you know, like they, he went to the the last two George Lance camps, I think. And, you know, everybody loves him. He's amazing and great teacher and a great um, faculty person, but, uh, you know, and he has such a great personality, you know, they just want to, so, so sometimes people just come for the, the, the specific faculty and that's great, but you know, I don't, I don't need to, like, as far as my, when I set my budget, I don't really budget for the, those, those, I'm budgeting for the kids in Kansas city, you know, like, cause I know they're going to be there every year. And of course I'm mainly focused on providing something for the, even the, the littlest kids are the ones that need it the most every year, you know, like take one year off for a, an eight year old and it's catastrophic. You know, if a, if a, if an 18 year old skips ISB, you know, like one year, I don't think it's, I mean, he's going to regret it. I'm sure he's not going to be destroyed. You know, 
he's, he, next time you see him, he's not going to be playing guitar or anything yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> but at those young ages, like you're saying, yeah, like every year, it's like a, it's like dog years or something, you know? You, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I know just working with three-year-olds, you know, like it's five minutes a day. That's what you need, not two hours at the end of the month. That would equal the same amount. But it, it, you're crazy, you know, like do you not know how a child's mind works. That's one of the reasons why that exists like that. So it's pretty cool. Johnny, thank you so much for talking. What a great conversation. How inspiring. Doesn't it make you want to go start your own bass festival? Go start your own bass festival if you haven't. I've done two, so and I'm we've got a great one here in San Francisco. But you should start your own festival. Just like Johnny said, what a great interview. And we've got much more this week about teaching, an episode every day this week, five episodes looking at teaching from a different angle. And I'm going to save the listener feedback for next week, kind of keep this week tied together as a unified whole. But I love hearing from people. Thank you so much for writing in. I get feedback every day. I love to hear from people you. And it helps me shape the show. It helps me grow the show. And I love sharing it. Just write in feedback at ContrabasedConversations.com, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Let me know if you've got a guest idea, if you've got an idea for a thematic week like I'm doing here. I love doing that every once in a while. So be great to hear from you. And check out ContrabasedConversations.com slash teaching. I'm really excited about this page. It's step-by-step information for every level that a base student might be at. So it's something you can share with a beginning student, like, what do I need? Well, it's got what I recommend, which is based on all these hundreds of interviews. It's something that I think will be useful. It's as clean and clear and no nonsense as I can make it down to step one, get a teacher. Step two, rent a base. Step three, get these books. I recommend the Vance books. And I have a little more information about that. Uh, So check it out. Let me know your thoughts. If you have any suggestions for additions to it, let me know. I think this is the 27th revision that I've done on that page over the last week. So I'm working hard on it. I'll continue to work on it. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you to Dario for sponsoring Come back tomorrow with our interview with Corky Watkins of Rice University about comprehensive musicianship through performance, her book Rosin Dust, and how to take a long-term view of teaching. It's such a great interview. I'm so excited about this week. See you soon for more life in the low end of the spectrum. <laughs>